at this point I would say to people, please raise your hand if you uh, if you didn't know um, that the first official Jewish transport to Auschwitz was all young women. And um, and I've now uh, done this in Madrid and England and all over America. And generally there's one or two people who will raise their hands and know that. And it's because they read Rena's Promise, which was my first book. Um, I do have a presentation that I'm going to do, but um, in light of the season, I'm going to read an excerpt from the book. This is in chapter 14, and it's right after the girls have a, 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 a rip, arrived. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a dyslexic moment. It's late here. I'm in England. <laughs> Borders have closed, and I'm isolating in England uh, with, my, with my husband, oh, and now I'm checking my hair. Oh dear. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to read you a little section about um, about Easter and Passover. On Thursday, April second, this is 1942. The third transport arrived in Auschwitz, carrying 965 unmarried Jewish young women. As the sun sank below the horizon and the guard towers loomed up dark and threatening, Block Five was once again full of girls being attacked by fleas and bed bugs. It was the one week anniversary of the first transport and the first night of Passover. In honor of the holiday, the SS sent everyone out to work in a damp hole like you've never saw before, Margie Becker says. The swamp detail entailed clearing refuse from ponds and streams around the compound. Soaking wet, 26-year-old Clary Atlas, the daughter of one of Humana's rabbis, got up off her bunk and spoke fervently to the girls as they shivered and wept. This is after they've worked all day. At home, everyone would get pneumonia, she told them, trying to raise their spirits, spirits just as she had that day the train had taken them from home one week earlier. You'll see, God will help us. Nobody will get sick. Speaking as passionately as her father, she told them how God would free them just as he had freed the Jews from Egypt. God had protected them from the plagues and he would protect them now. God had slain their ancestors slaver, slavers and he would slay them now. All they had to do was invite Elijah into their hearts. If only they had enough cups to leave one for the prophet. If only they could open the door without getting killed. Clary's conviction spread through the block and soon some of the girls were holding tiny satyrs on their bunks. Others simply fell asleep. Um, so I'm just gonna skip forward because um, for those of you who know about the um, Seder uh, Passover ceremony, there are four questions, four questions that are asked and, <clears throat> in 1942. And nowadays there are five questions. Um, the fifth question um, is, why? In 1942, there had been no Shoah yet. It was only after World War II that satyrs began to add a fifth child to represent all of the Jewish children who did not survive, and a final fifth question to ponder, why? Um, so the uh, we go all the way to the end of this chapter. Sorry, I just sort of quickly wanted to read this to you. Um, this is a footnote um, and, well, not really a footnote. The solemn silence of block 10 was shattered by gunshots ringing through the night as 11 Polish prisoners were shot against the execution wall outside of block 10. This is where the girls were held. The next morning was Good Friday and the fourth transport of 997 unmarried Jewish girls and young women arrived into Auschwitz camp. Quote, on Easter Sunday, 89 prisoners and 31 Russian POWs died. We do not know how many, if any, of those 89 prisoners were female, but it was becoming clear that the Nazis had no qualms about defiling either the Christian or Jewish religions. Um, so that's a little excerpt from the book. Um, and uh, one of the women who has a Seder 
uh, that first uh, in 1942 and then in 1943 is Bertha Berkowitz and you're about to learn a little bit more about Bertha. Okay, sorry. sorry about that guys. Um, all right, so this, um, I just found these home movies. This is from 1932, Human Slovakia. So I am uh, producing a documentary film as well as uh, writing the book, 999. <clears throat> and part of uh, creating a film is, uh, it's harder <laughs> because you have to um, find footage to show the, show the pictures of what you're writing about rather than just describing it and, and talking to people. So, this is actually some of the families. Uh, some of these girls are going to go to Auschwitz on the first transport. Um, I don't, ha don't have them all identified, but they are part of the Gross family, the Grossman family, and the Klein family, and the little boy with the cap right there. That is Ladislav Grossman, who is a very, very famous, or was a very famous author and <clears throat> Oscar winning uh, screenwriter. So, um, and he marries uh, Edith Grossman, who is the uh, survivor who I interviewed extensively for this book. And Edith is 95 and lives in Toronto. And um, I just spoke to her <coughs> uh, the other day for Passover. So, um, as you already got the introduction, um, so these are all young women, um, the 999 and they did turn themselves in voluntarily because they thought that they were going to, um, to work and had no idea of where they were going. So they came from all over Slovakia. Um, and these are, uh, I'm gonna, this is the rural part, of, this is Humana, where Edith is from. Um, Mikovic, Preshov had quite a large Jewish community. I have, <clears throat> there were girls from Kranitsa and Tillage in Poland who were actually hiding in Humina. And they gathered them together. Excuse me while I drink a little water. They had to register for work in their hometown. And then they were put onto a passenger train or into a, um, a bus or a truck um, or a horse cart. And they were taken to Poprad where there was an army barrack that was waiting for them. And, uh, and that's where the girls were held, concentrated for uh, about five days while <clears throat> other villages and towns were brought in until they had a quota. And then they were put <clears throat> onto uh, the transport. Uh, so this is um, the Berkowitz family, Bertha Berkowitz, who just appeared with the yellow right there. That's Bertha. Her best friend is next to her. That's Pesci Steiner. And, um, and this is Herschel. The Berkowitz family, um, nobody in this photograph survives except for Bertha and Herschel. Herschel was actually sent to Argentina before the Holocaust started. This is Bertha's mother. This is Bertha's sister and Bertha's sister and Bertha's sister. This is Bertha's brother. Um, Fanny is not in this photo. She does survive. I met Fanny uh, in New York um, in January for the book launch at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And she's 96 and she's doing okay. She is isolating and she's with her uh, daughter. So, um, but I love this photo, especially for the season because this, they're holding matzahs and those are the rollers and they had huge parties. Um, and made the matzah for Passover. So Rina and Danka, Rina was um, the first uh, woman from the first transport that I met. Uh, she was from Tillage, Poland. And this is Rina here. This is Danka, her sister. This is pre-war in Kranitsa. And this is them after the war, not long after, probably a few months after, uh, and they're in Holland. Um, and uh, this is the book, Rena's Promise. Um, and this is a memoir. It's different than 999. 999 is a nonfiction, um, <clears throat> big, fat, 400 pages, lots of source notes, loads, 42 photographs, amazing photographs. Um, and, uh, but Rena's Promise is a first person story. 
Um, this is a gross family and this is a super important part and it's really the gross family is the reason why I'm here today. So Rena knew Adela. This is Adela Gross. That's Adela Gross. That's just Adela. Um, and she saw her be selected and go to the gas. And this that's uh, Adela's cousin, Lou. And literally 70 years later, I was in Slovakia and the Gross family discovered me and learned. They read Rena's Promise and they discovered what happened to Adela. It took them 70 years to find out what happened to Adela. And so I was so bowled over by this experience that I began to wonder how many other stories were out there and, um, and, and if I could find those stories, if I might be able to bring um, not only peace to those families, but peace to them through this work because they get the, the young women become recognized. So this is Adela. And this is Henya Ehrenberger. Um, and she, um, so both of these girls went to school with Edith, who you'll see in a second, and, um, and neither of them survived. I don't know who the other girls are in this, in this photograph. This is Edith. Um, this picture is post-war. So you can see how young she is. She's in Auschwitz from the age of 17 for three years. So um, I think it's really important to understand how young they were. Um, this is Edith's sister, Leah, and this is Edith. Uh, this is the Beth Jacobs School. It's a picture of, um, it's a drama school. The Beth Jacobs School used to come to Humano once a year in the summer and do a dramatic event and everybody would dress up and do theater. And this is Edith over here. Um, I'm not sure what year it is. I think it's like 1938, maybe I'm looking, I think she's about 12 there. This is Margie Becker, who plays a big part in the book. This is Leah, Edith's sister. Um, and some of these other girls I don't have identified, but they're probably in here. <clears throat> in this photograph, there are seven girls who are Jewish. Um, and only three of them survive. And of those three who survive, only two of them were, uh, um, two of them did not go to Auschwitz. This is Edith right here. This is Regina um, Grebarova. Um, she dies in Auschwitz and Margie Becker witnesses her death. So, um, uh, so that's part of what I do is I read these, find these testimonies and then I sort of connect the dots because there's no record of Regina at all, but I know from Margie's testimony who she's talking about when she's referring to um, a friend of hers dying. Then, I just lost my cursor, there it is. Um, <clears throat> I just forgot her name, but this is one of the Jewish girls. This is one of the Jewish girls. This is one of the girls. Uh, she doesn't, uh, so not, all four of them do not survive. There's somebody else over on the other side of the screen. Um, and, uh, okay. Let's see. So um, from Popra, they're taken out of the barrack and they are taken onto a train, uh, which is the typical cattle cars. This is the first time, right? Um, there have been other minor transports, like, you know, 60 people, men, all men, um, going, you know, to be, to, to, be to go to Auschwitz or something, but this is the first official Jewish transport. Official means it was ordered by Himmler, and it is. Um, it's one of the big questions in the book: Why take girls? Um, so they travel in cattle cars through the night. They they are loaded onto these trains in the middle of the night <clears throat> and taken. And it's about a ten-hour trip. Um, they get there in the morning. And Edith says when they arrive in Auschwitz, um, it's an empty place, absolutely empty. So at the same time that the girls arrive, just two hours prior to that, 999 prisoners from Ravensbrück have arrived. They've also been ordered by Himmler. <clears throat> they are going to be the guards for these Jewish girls and the more the Jewish young women and girls that are coming. 
but it's the exact same number. And I find this really interesting. And I did an entire chapter in the book. Himmler was very into astrology and numerology. And I believe that he set it up, the dates and everything. So I won't go into it here, but it's pretty, pretty fascinating. A little creepy too. Very creepy. Um, so uh, this is, um, not all of these uh, capos were nice and not all of them were bad. Um, this was one who was, was nice. They did call her the Angel of Auschwitz. Um, and, and she is a, serves a part of our story as well. Um, so it's March, it's 1942, it's March 26th, and it's snowy um, and cold. And in fact, there's a blizzard in April um, in, in Auschwitz. And Edith says that um, they had to take their shoes off because uh, they had these, um, they had these, uh, they call them clappers. They were basically like Birkenstocks without the arch support and um, like a piece of slab of wood with a, with a leather strap over it. And they were clopping on their heels when they walked. And one of the SS at the gate, at the Arbeitmann Frei gate, um, said that the shoes were bothering his ears. So he made the girls take their shoes off and march through the snow as they went out to work. Really nice stuff. Um, I've been to Auschwitz in a blizzard and it's, um, I mean, that's where the footage came from. <laughs> it's a pretty uh, intense experience. I can't imagine being a prisoner in it uh, in, in this kind of weather. Um, so part of this book is um, based on archival work. And I spent a lot of time in the Slovak National Archives. Now, I don't read Slovak. I did have a translator, but I did, I had a dictionary and I know enough about linguistics to be able to figure some things out. And, and then I had help. Um, but it was the documents I was really interested in. And, and so for instance, this document, it's a telegram. It's going to Dr. Kanka. Geza Kanka was head of the um, Jewish department. Um, and he was also head of the Ministry of Transportation. How convenient. So this telegram is dated uh, March 28th, 1942. And it's basically, uh, it's coming from a town, Liptovsky. I don't speak Slovak, so I'm, if somebody does, I really apologize for mispronouncing these words. Um, and it's saying that um, they would like to, Elzbeta Sternova um, is a really good worker and they would like her not to have to go do government service and the shoe factory uh, because she um, is such a vital worker, worker to their company. So, um, of course, the point of this telegram is not just the request, but it's the date. She was already in Auschwitz by this point, and Elsbetta does not survive. Now, these are exceptions. Exceptions are like exemptions. And in order to get an exemption from the government, you had to apply, sort of like everybody in America is applying now for unemployment. Um, everybody all over the world is applying for unemployment, actually. So you can imagine this is paperwork, and it didn't, it did not get processed quickly. It took um, in June. I sort of counted the days. It took about two and a half weeks to get processed and get. A response. And then once it came back to the mayor's office, once your request was processed and got back to the mayor's office, it took another three days to be approved, which means a lot of people ended up being deported before they were, uh, they were approved. Now, obviously, not everybody was approved either. These packets are all full of letters um, requesting, you know, like, we, we support the economy, we're important people, please don't deport us. Then letters of reference from clergy, rabbis, um, officials to help your case. And in the case of um, Adela Gross and Edith, Gr Edith um, who I write about Edith Friedman Grossman, um, 
in their case, they came from, Ella Della Gross came from a super wealthy family, super, super wealthy. But the exceptions didn't come in in time. Edith's father, actually, um, he was a glacier and he worked on airplanes. So he had an absolutely vitally important job to the war effort. And yet Edith and Leah still went to Auschwitz because the exception came late. Uh, came two weeks after they had been deported. And in one of the pretty amazing stories that I uncovered was one family, the exception arrived the day the girls were deported and the father got in a car, got, had a driver pick him up and they chased the train across Slovakia trying to rescue Magda Amster and they did not. Uh, now, this is part of our film, and, um, and I'm going to walk you through this very quickly. So this is Orna Tuckman. Her mother was Martha Greger, and you can see right there, that is her mother's name. This GIF moves a little bit too quickly. I do apologize. There's her mother's name. Um, so Orna went to Yad Vashem in, in Israel, and this is the original list that is completely typed up and um, has all the names of every girl that was on the transport list. And finding that list was a huge boon for my research because I typed it in and I analyzed the data. So I know for a fact that we had at least 298 teenagers, teenage girls on the transport. Now, it turns out, in fact, that there may have been many more because I heard from uh, a survivor's uh, son that his mother i said oh your mother was born on like uh 1914 and he said no she was born in 1924. so we're talking about manual typewriters they're mistakes so there may have been many more teenagers than we know for sure um so i'm gonna just uh also tell you we went to preshov and this list where Orna is, is in the Preshov Great Synagogue. And she's just found the list of all the people in the Preshov Jewish community who did not survive the Holocaust. And it has her family, um, everybody in her family on there, except for her mother um, who did survive. So um, that's it for my presentation at this point. I could go on and on all night. I do want to give you a couple of heads up. So you can become a subscriber to my newsletter uh, with updates um, about the film, the documentary we're producing. We are still raising money for funds. And um, I do have a new survivor that I just discovered who's in Sydney, Australia raising funds to film her as soon as we can come out of quarantine. Um, her name is Elizabeth Silberman, and uh, she was friends with a couple of the women that I've written about. She's quite um, bright. She was a, uh, I, I adore her. She was a um, dress designer, a, a couture, couture. And, um, and this is Edith uh, looking at you in the camera. That's our website, www.999themovie or thebook.com. You can also find me on Facebook uh, at 999themovie.com or Rena's Promise. And I just want to let you know that when this is all over, um, I am not far from New Canaan, and I would love to meet you personally and sign your books. Um, since I can't do that for you tonight, uh, it, would, it would really mean a lot to me to be able to, um, well, I don't know if we're shaking hands by that point, but I can certainly <laughs> sign books. And I would love to take some questions and answers at this point. Great, I just unmuted myself, so I'm happy to help field any questions that come in with you. Um, for all of our participants, you can type your questions into the Q&A panel. That's located towards the bottom of your Zoom screen. Hi, um, I actually uh, do have a very interesting question. I um, haven't finished the book yet, Heather, um, but I do really um, um, want to ask about Himmler's uh, fascination with astrology or the the 
the numbers and how um, did that, was it just him or did other officers, do you know in Germany possibly followed that? Because I know there was a lot of talk that other. Um, well, Goebbels was very into astrology and they did have a Nostradamus department where they um, were uh, trying to analyze the prophecies of Nostradamus. So, it, um, you know, Goebbels at one point, um, you know, they, they had, <clears throat> they were pretty good at interpreting things to suit their own needs. And um, so they decided that Nostradamus had actually um, predicted the fall of Paris. Um, so yeah, there was quite a bit uh, in, in the um, Third Reich, I found one of the most interesting points, and I do mention it in the book, is that you have um, uh, astrologers were uh, considered so powerful that if they didn't work for the state, the Third Reich, they could end up in a concentration camp. And so um, if you were political and didn't want to support the Reich, or if you were a communist and didn't want to support the Reich, um, you, could be, uh, you could be sent to a concentration camp because you were an astrologer. Um, so yeah, <laughs> they really believed in this stuff. Not everybody, um, but, but certainly Himmler was, uh, at one point there was the, um, they said if you wanted to find out what Himmler was going to do next, you, uh, you asked his astrologer. And that was in 1944, or no, 45, sorry. Right, Christian. Thank you for answering that. I know I jumped in there just. No, I'm glad. That's a great question. Um, but if was... other people have questions, please do uh, bring up uh, questions in the uh, chat room. In yeah. the question area. <clears throat> so if there are any questions or, or people are being shy, I'm going to do another screen share and I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple more people. Um, so uh, let's see, it's 930 right now. Um, I have to go to my presentation mode. Ready for on current side. Um, okay, so um, so one of the things that uh, I am really shocked by in terms of my um, my research is that um, sorry, just going to go back here. Rosa Zimmerspitz. So one of the things that we uh, we I learn is that um, you know women's uh, death records are almost uh, they're not kept for the first five months that the women are in camp and Rosa Zimmerspitz um, wasn't killed until 1943 but um, it's quite an quite uh, the, it's not written about anywhere she and her three sisters um, are uh, tortured executed and it's, there's no death record about them and there's no record of them being caught. And it's a big part of the book because this is, this is um, you know, when a man dies in Auschwitz, his number's written down and his name is written down. When a woman dies in Auschwitz, it literally says a woman, one female. And so it's very hard for us to, uh, to discover all of this history. Um, these are some of the other girls. Um, like I said, there's 42 photographs in the book, and um, and a lot of these photos come from families. Uh, I um, this and this this picture just came in just in January. These girls were sisters, and um, and they're actually related to the Gross family. Um, I see that there's a question there. Does somebody want to um, ask this question? Sure, I'll read it out loud for you. So the question is, why were the Nazis focused on eradicating young, unmarried Jewish women? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. Okay, yeah, it is eradicating. So if you want to get rid of a race of people, who are you going to get rid of? your breeding stock, right? Um, it's, it is a tradition in war zones um, and throughout human history, genocide attacks young women first, either through murder or rape. And, um, and it is, you know, a dirty little fact of humanity. 
And I think that's one of the reasons why I feel that this history is so important that we pay attention to this because we still see it today. And, um, and the fact that so few people, yeah, I mean, people who've read loads and loads and loads about the Holocaust and World War II, and, and it's, it's, it's not there. You can open up a Holocaust timeline, um, you know, like there's a big fat book called The Holocaust with a little timeline in it. And granted, it was published, you know, about 20 years ago, but still, um, you know, it's not, it's not a secret that the first transport was all young women. It doesn't say it. It says the first transport arrived in Auschwitz. It doesn't say it was all young women. Now, why would you not say that? Why, why would you not say that? I don't get it. So, um, you know, it, it, to me, this is really about um, women's history and girls' history. And, and I think it's really important that we, uh, that we pay attention that um you know that we pay attention to this history but it is uh sadly that's that's the basis of the of the why why would you attack young women to get rid of the race yeah so someone else kind of just piggybacked off that i don't know if it was on accident or on purpose but she said is the reason why women were sent to concentration camps uh so they could stop them from reproducing yeah, so a lot of these young women um, are experimented on, and in fact, Orna Tuckman, <clears throat> the uh, picture that you saw of Orna in uh, Yad Vashem, Orna discovered, one of the reasons I, I met Orna was that her mother passed away and she contacted me and uh, said, um, if you ever go to Slovakia and Poland, I'd like to go with you. And so I took a group of people, of, of children with me, and we did, you know, I gave them a little tour. And um, Orna had just discovered after her mother died that she was adopted and her mother had been sterilized. So um, it was a big thing trying to figure out how to sterilize these young women. And Rena, um, who was in my, is my first book, was, was put aside into a group that looked like they were going to be sterilized and she escaped from it in a really great, you know, she had a lot of chutzpah. Um, so there are um, there are several cases uh, like this. I don't know how many other women were serialized. The other thing, though, I will mention here, um, which I think is important to know, is that most of these young, yeah, most of the women who survived, right, had a terrible time conceiving. Really, really difficult. Um, they had a lot of miscarriages. I, I have not met one survivor of the first transport who did not have a miscarriage and uh and rena ended up having four children finally but she lost the first baby and i think she lost the third um so you know it that's the other way that you um you know that this uh history uh attacking young women mm -hmm. So another question, uh, you mentioned that some were able to get deportation exemptions, but I thought you said that they were voluntary. Could you please explain? Yeah, so um, you had to register, but if you had an exemption, you could, uh, you, you would be exempt from having to go to government service. None of the girls on the first transports exemptions arrived in time, so they all had to go. Adela Gross should have had an exemption. Edith and Leah should have had exemptions. Magda Amster should have had an exemption. Um, two other two other cousins should have should have had exemptions because they worked on a farm and they were um, they were vital to the health and the work of the farm. But because no exemptions had gone through, they they all ended up going to Auschwitz. Um, and in fact, the exemptions were. Um, I mean, they did, they did work. Um, so the, the cousins that ended up going to Auschwitz, the rest of the family didn't go to camp. They, they were never deported because they were running a farm and they, and, you know, people need food. So, um, that's, a, that's an essential job. And so, uh, yeah, so nobody, nobody in the first transport got an exemption. Um, there, and there are a couple of women. There's an interesting case um, on the second transport. There's a woman called Magda Blau. I'm sorry, Magda Hellinger. Uh, her, mate, her married name is Blau. Um, and she uh, was a, 
she was supposed to have an exemption because she was a government worker and they um uh, a police officer you know came on to her she turned him down and he sold her exemption to somebody else heather thank you so much for coming tonight i'm really yeah please do you can always ask me questions on facebook and um and you can reach us through the website and subscribe to the newsletter we just had a newsletter go out covering the passover story with bertha berkowitz and her seder that she held in auschwitz and um and thank you so much joan Haddon. i just saw a thank you there i really uh, appreciate we did just get a question here this oh, is from kathy townsend. kathy townsend hi kathy thanks so much for your question um you know <clears throat> i became interested in the subject because of rena and rena actually um was from connecticut originally uh, well, not originally, obviously she's from Poland originally, but she um, she lived in um, not far in uh, in um, oh, I'm just blanking. Anyway, um, she ended up in Bethel uh, towards the end of her life, and I met her in North Carolina. But um, yeah, you know, I met Rena, and then I thought that's it. I'm not going to write another Holocaust book because um, you know it takes a lot out of you. It's very emotional, and and it was when I. Um, so I didn't, I haven't written about the Holocaust since the, not, you know, 90s. My for, Rena's Promise came out in 95. Um, but uh, I was living in Europe and I decided to make a little pilgrimage um, to Slovakia on the anniversary of the first transport. Um, and, and then I traveled from Poprad, Slovakia to Auschwitz on a 10 hour train ride. But when I was in Slovakia, um, I discovered that there were huge events going on to honor the young women of the first transport, which I had never known before. And um, and then they discovered that there was a New Yorker <laughs> who was in Poprad and knew about the women of the first transport. And so all these newspapers were like, what are you doing here? And um, and it was quite amazing. I was really embraced by the people of the country, and they were really interested in um, Rena's promise and. And then I started hearing from other families. And that was when I went, you know, there's there's more, there's there's more to the story than um, you know, when I wrote Rena's Promise, it was before the internet. Um, it was, we didn't have as easy communication. And um, and I didn't I didn't know, you know, I thought there may be a one or two women had survived. Um, at this point, I would say probably at least about a hundred did. I know of, I know of over forty who survived at this point, and uh, and 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 I'm sure, and I, I think there were more. It's very hard to know because at the end of the war, not everybody went back to their home country. So about twenty women went back to Slovakia. So Slovakia itself because of the Iron Curtain when that came down, thought only 20 women had survived from the first transport. But of course, you know, there were women who, um, Rena and Danka, they stayed in Holland. A bunch of women were freed in Sweden. I know somebody who was free, who was in Sweden went straight to America because she knew her family was gone. I mean, if you know your family's gone, why would you go back to Poland or Slovakia? You wouldn't, um, unless you were trying to find family. And so, uh, you know, a lot of these women ended up never going back to Slovakia or Poland. They went straight to, um, you know, a, from a displaced person's camp to Israel. A lot of them ended up in Israel. A lot of them ended up in Australia. And Melbourne, Australia has a really large community of uh, first transport survivors. So I know, um, I know five in, in Melbourne, Australia. They're not, none of them are alive anymore. And then I know three in Sydney and one of them is, uh, two are still alive. Sorry, two. I want to just say uh, to everybody who's still on, I really hope you're staying safe and healthy. And um, and one of the, if I, I like to try to end with a message of hope because um, this can be a pretty uh, intense uh, history, but um, the women who survived, many of them helped each other. It was, a, to me, it's a story of sisterhood and um, solidarity and, and, you know, and they survived epidemic. Um, epidemic was a big part of surviving Auschwitz. 
and um, and so we are really lucky that we have um, science on our side, and we have uh, we know what's going on, and we just have to <clears throat> sit still and <laughs> stay put. Um, and uh, you're welcome, Kathy. And um, and so I hope that you all stay very, very safe and healthy and are caring for your loved ones in the best way that you can. And I really appreciate everybody signing on tonight and uh, taking part in this. I'm sorry I can't meet you in person. Heather, thank you again so much. Sorry, I preempted that last wonderful, interesting question. But um, I want everyone to know that Heather is uh, Zooming from London, or not London, from England, England. on the uh, border of, with Wales, is that correct? That's right, on the border of Wales, yeah. I'd show you outside, but it's pitch black, but it's very beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you again thank very, you. very much.